Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ravi Alhadimani. I'm an assistant professor at Department of Mechanical and Nuclear Engineering of Virginia Commonwealth University. I also have uh, an affiliate position at Biomedical Engineering of Virginia Commonwealth University and um, at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of Iowa State University. The title of my talk today is Magnetic Neuromodulation, a non-invasive and safe treatment for brain disorders. Um, I'm talking more specifically on transcranial magnetic stimulation. I'll talk a little bit about our uh, recent work on development of brain phantom for neuromodulation and neuroimaging. So what is transcranial magnetic stimulation? Basically, when a time-varying magnetic field encounters conducting material by Faraday's law of induction, it induces eddy currents in the material. So if you want to put that in equation, it's del cross E equals minus dB by dt, so the change in B, that is magnetic flux or magnetic field, results in an induced electric field in conducting material. So if you apply TMS on the brain, then the conducting material of interest for us is neurons. So you can interfere with the synaptic uh, transmission of neurons. So um, if you look at synaptic synaptic firing of neurons. So um, neurons have a resting, motor thre res resting threshold at minus 70 millivolts, um, or uh, resting potential at minus 70 millivolts. And when you surpass uh, a threshold of minus 55 millivolts by TMS, you can initiate an action potential. But if you can also induce an electric field that is equivalent to uh, inducing a voltage of first uh, plus 40 millivolts, then you can um, create a, a firing between um, two neuron uh, synapses. So, uh, you can use um, the time magnetic field from a transcranial magnetic stimulation device to induce firing in neurons. Or you can also um, stop a uh, signal propagation in neuron. So by uh, using either um, either uh, by uh, initiating a firing potential or stopping a neuron propagation, you can, um, you can treat several psychiatric and new, uh, neurological disorders. How we can do that, I will um, uh, show in following slides. So before that, um, a transcranial magnetic device mainly consists of a circuit like this. So basically it has a large capacitor that can store um, large voltage and discharge in a coil. So a coil is nothing but a, uh, a, a copper winding that has a specific inductance. So when a large a voltage or a current is discharged from a capacitor into this coil, um, it creates a time varying magnetic field coming out of this coil. That magnetic field, if you place it on any part of the brain, you can induce eddy currents or electric field in that part of the brain. So, the signal coming out of a coil, if you uh, see the bottom corner image, 
the black line or back black curve is the magnetic field and the red curve is the induced electric field so there is a phase lag um, so the induced electric field in conducting media that is in the neuron uh, la lags behind by um, about 90 degrees um, from the magnetic field so you use um, a device like this that's in that's shown in the circuit diagram uh, to uh, pulse uh, a magnetic field using through the coil on a specific part of the brain so usually the currents are high but they are for a very short duration the pulse duration is 0 0.4 milliseconds meaning the signal frequency um, is 2.5 kilohertz it's not the same as the repetition rate a lot of people get confused between the repetition rate and the signal frequency of tms so the signal fre frequency here is 2.5 kilohertz that means the pulse is only for a 0.4 millisecond duration uh, with an amplitude of 5000 amps so when you repeat these pulses uh, 10 times that becomes 10 hertz which is a repetition rate which is normally what is used for the treatment of depression um, in a clinical setting so um, usually 10 hertz with 10 hertz repetition rate uh, the, the uh, if you uh, uh, treat for five days um, for an, for a half an hour per day for two months it results in a permanent uh, physiological changes in the brain um, so this is also the FDA approved protocol for treating depression so the magnetic field uh, profile in the brain depends on the shape of the coil um, and also the shape of the signal that is sent to the coil So there are many therapeutic uses of transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, usually it is called as RTMS. R stands for repetitive TMS. So when you use, uh, when you pulse the uh, field continuously um, several times a second, it becomes a repetitive TMS. Um, so it has shown a lot of uh, therapeutic uh, uh, uses. Um, so the the one that is most common and which is quietly uh, quite widely used um, in recent years is for measured depressive disorder so TMS is uh, uh, is FDA approved for treating depression or treating major depressive disorder um, it was approved in 2008 um, for uh, Neurostar. Um, so it was approved um, for using Neurostar uh, device. Uh, but currently, even MagSteam, uh, Brainsway, and MagVenture devices are also approved. So currently, there are four to five uh, 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 device makers uh, whose devices are FDA approved for uh, treating depression. Uh, it's also approved for uh, treating migraine. Um, this happened recently in two th uh, 2017. Um, the, the company uh, that was approved is eNeuro. And it's also approved for obsessive compulsive disorder. And it, this is also approved recently um, in 2018 uh, for Brainsway uh, device. So um, there are three uh, disorders that have been approved uh, by FDA um, now um, for to use TMS. So there are also new, numerous open label studies and clinical, clinical trials. Um, if you take any new, uh, neurological or psychiatric disorder, um, they, you will find one or the other either open label or clinical trial studies ongoing or just uh, completed 
uh, in the literature. So TMS has uh, recently taken off um, and it's uh, becoming very popular. Uh, there are various reasons for that. So the main advantages of TMS uh, are it's first non-invasive um, and it's safe. Uh, not many uh, um, side effects or adverse uh, effects have been uh, uh, reported. It's inexpensive and it can be conducted in an outpatient setting. So uh, TMS is also um, very target specific. That is, if you want to treat certain neurological disorder um, that originates from certain region of the brain, you can specifically target that region um, to some extent. Um, there is also a disadvantage uh, about specificity, which I'll talk later. Um, so uh, because of these advantages, it has become very popular. You go to any major hospitals, uh, invariably you will find a TMS device, either in the Department of Psychiatry or Department of Neurology. Um, so, um, of course, it also has uh, many disadvantages. Um, they are they can be easily overcome. Uh, they're not uh, as bad compared to a surgery or a um, or a ionizing radiation treatment or. Uh, um, uh, or a, any invasive treatment. So uh, the disadvantages are uh, the stimulation currently is limited to cortical regions um, and uh, sp spatial focality is one of the issue. Um, that's because magnetic field decays very rapidly from the source of the coil or so, uh, from the source. So the uh, field that comes out of the coil um, decays so rapidly that in order to stimulate deeper regions of the brain, you had to um, overstimulate cortex. Um, that is not desirable. So that's why it's limited to uh, cortical regions. And also when you stimulate um, or when you use the TMS coil, you will hear uh, loud clicking sound. This is due to Lorentz forces um, and it can be annoying sometimes. Um, so uh, you are uh, required to wear or it's recommended to wear um, hearing protection um, when you are undergoing or when a patient is undergoing uh, TMS treatment. And also coils can heat up very quickly um, so if you go beyond uh, one or one and a half hours with the current coil, um, it can heat up and it might need external cooling. Um, so uh, this is because uh, we are pumping in 5,000 amps of current, although it's at very short duration, uh, it will you, and the, the, the coil material that is copper is uh, very conductive and it has less resistance, so it's, it, the small heat it produces um, for a long duration can add up and eventually you will, uh, you will have to stop the treatment uh, if you don't have an external cooling um, option. So these are the disadvantages. Of course, these can be overcome um, by small modifications. So coming to the coils themselves, so as I said, the field profile or the region that is being stimulated in the brain is decided by the shape of the coil. So if you see on the screen, on the left-hand side is the single circular coil, and on the right-hand side is the um, figure of eight coil or double coil. So in the first case, the field uh, coming out of the coil is not very focal. Um, if you look at the 
induced electric field, it uh, uh, it takes a shape of a donut. Um, so it's not very focal. You can't use this coil if you want to stimulate a very small region. Whereas uh, the figure of eight coil has two circular coils um, coming together, and at the center of the coil, center of the uh, figure of eight coil, the current from both the circles join in the middle, um, and that gives it um, a high strength and that is the hot spot and that um, is where you get the maximum stimulation that's where the induced electric field is the highest if you um, uh, you need to use that one as the hot spot so these are these were the two coils that were very um, popular until recently uh, <clears throat> so if you want to go deeper or you want to be more focal then you have to design uh, better coils so let's look at two commercial devices one is the neurostar and the other one is brainsway so on the left hand side is the neurostar which is written on the coil um, so there it's a it's a type of figure of eight coil but it uses some ferromagnetic iron core to um, focus the uh, field, but but it's at a cost of reducing the strength uh, to some extent. So you have a neurostar coil um, that is slightly focal, and then on the right hand side is the brainsway coil, which is like a helmet coil. And if you look at the uh, coil shape at the bottom it's it's very complex there are a lot of coil loops um so which add up um and it's not very focal um, but this can go this can stimulate deeper regions of the brain so these are the two may uh, two um uh, popular uh, tms devices so when uh, I was at Iowa State University, my lab um, came up with a novel coil um, called Halo Coil. Um, so this coil uh, was designed in order to improve the penetration of the field deeper in the brain regions. So um, the previous uh, two coils I showed. Um, Oh, the, among them, the brainsway coil had a deeper penetration, but uh, by increasing the field strength at the cortex as well. Whereas in this new halo coil, you can retain the same amount of uh, field at the, at the cortex, but you only reduce the decay. So for the same amount of field, that is for the same motor threshold, you can engage uh, deeper regions of the brain. So the decay is reduced in this coil. This coil configuration is basically two circular coils. Um, one is the commercial circular coil on top, and the other one is the halo coil, which is at the eye level, um, which is much larger. It has a diameter of 290 millimeters and it has five tons. So when both the coils are stimulated simultaneously, you get a field profile as shown uh, in the graph here. So the red uh, graph shows the field um, from top of the coil to deeper in the brain. Um, and the black one is just the circular coil. So you can see that the field deep inside, that is, if you look at 0.1 meter, that is at 10 centimeter deeper in the brain, the uh, halo coil configuration has almost uh, twice the amount of field um, 
in the brain um, at that at that depth. Um, so you start with the same amount. Both start with the same amount. If you look at the zero zero value uh, on the x-axis, both con both the coils start with the same amount, but the black decays rapidly. Rapidly. Um, if you put even the figure of eight coil here, that also uh, will decay rapidly. It, in fact, it decays more rapidly than the circular coil. Um, so, for hello coil configuration, the decay rate, rate is reduced. So, based on the hello coil configuration, we developed another uh, coil called as triple halo coil. So basically, um, in order to avoid any stimulation to the eyes or retina or the olfactory nerve, we came up with uh, three coil configurations um, around your eyes and nose. Um, so each uh, coil here have different uh, current direction. So basically, so the, uh, the currents or the magnetic field in front of your face um, is reduced because of multiple directions um, of the current and it adds up at the back. So if you look at different regions of the brain um, and calculate the induced electric field in different regions, um, the induced electric field does not in any region exceed the threshold field that is needed to initiate an action potential. So that means um, with triple halo coil, uh, you can safely use to reduce the uh, decay rate, but the directionality will be uh, will be uh, a problem here. So this is uh, one of the configuration we developed to reduce the decay rate. That is, you can uh, stimulate deeper regions uh, at the same amount of cortical uh, field strength. So the other uh, coil configuration we developed is called the quadruple butterfly coil. And this is developed to improve the focality on the cortex. This, uh, the, the field here doesn't go uh, deep. Um, the, the area of stimulation on the cortex is reduced with this coil configuration compared to figure of eight coil. So figure of eight coil uh, currently is the most focal coil, um, but you can reduce or you can increase the focality further with this design called the quadruple butterfly, butterfly coil. So you can see uh, from the results uh, that figure of eight coil in A uh, has a certain area of stimulation which is reduced uh, when you use a quadruple butterfly coil. So this can be used for stimulating a smaller region. For example, if you want to uh, stimulate primary auditory cortex um, for reducing schizophrenia symptoms, um, you have to use a coil that is more focal than a uh, figure of eight coil. We think quadruple butterfly coil might be able to do that. So in order to uh, design coils, we need to calculate uh, induced electric field in the brain, or we need to calculate the magnetic field coming out of the coil. Calculating magnetic field coming out of the coil is easy because the brain regions are non-magnetic, their magnetic permeability is close to one, so, they, so the magnetic field uh, that is calculated in any part of the brain does not affect uh, the field itself. So the magnetic field will be same for a homogeneous 
uh, head as well as a anatomically uh, realistic or anatomically accurate uh, head. Whereas the induced electric field or the eddy currents is a different story. Because different brain regions have different electrical conductivity, the eddy currents in different regions will be different um, when you uh, apply a TMS field. So it is important to uh, calculate the induced electric field using anatomically accurate or anatomically realistic head models. So that's what we have sh shown here in this uh, view graph. So uh, on the left side is the standard anthropomorphic model that has homogeneous uh, head. And on the right is the um, anatomically realistic head um, that is derived from the MRI images of, of a patient. So yeah, you see the induced electric field uh, below these uh, head models, uh, you can see for a, a realistic head model, the induced electric field is not homogeneous. You can see there are certain spots that have high stimulation, although they are away from the coil. They are far from the coil, even though, um, uh, even then they have a uh, high induced electric field, whereas that's not the case with the homogeneous head. So that, that's why it's important to use anatomically accurate brain models using, uh, using MRI images of a patient. So uh, another example or another case where you can see a large difference is when you compare an adult with a child uh, head or brain. Um, so below, is the induced electric field along Z axis. So that is from the surface of the coil or the cortex uh, deeper inside the brain in the Z axis. So below uh, the head models, you, you see the graphs. On the left hand side is a graph that, uh, that is uh, calculated using homogeneous head. And on the right hand side is the heterogeneous head. Um, so you can see that for a homogeneous head model, uh, 34 year old or 26 year old or 11 year old or six year old head models show the same induced electric field as you move uh, deeper inside the brain. But if you look on the right hand side of the graph, um, you can see that the induced electric field varies significantly uh, at different, uh, uh, for different age groups, uh, for different age uh, uh, patients or head models. So um, it is important to uh, use an individualized head model to calculate the induced electric field in, uh, in a region of interest. So we have developed uh, several head models of both healthy as well as uh, different disordered uh, head models. Our 50 healthy head models have been uh, licensed by Zurich MedTech. Um, people uh, from, who want to use it for academic research can download these head models for free. Um, so there's a link here. Um, or if you uh, uh, search this uh, mm, digital object identifier, uh, you will get the link to the website of Zurich MedTech where you can download these head models. And these head models can be used for um, any neuromodulation technique. You can either use for KDCS or DBS or TMS. So we have also developed Parkinson's head models, uh, schizophrenic head models, um, and PTSD and TBI head models. Um, so we have all these repository of head models that we can uh, use to study the um, stimulation profiles uh, 
um, by either TMS, TDCS, or DBS. So that's about head modeling. We have also uh, done some uh, cell culture studies. So one might ask why cell culture studies? Um, TMS was uh, approved by FDA uh, for cortical stimulation um, much earlier uh, or without a, a significant amount of uh, uh, research going into it. Uh, in terms of uh, cell culture or animal studies. So there is uh, uh, little research reported on cell, st uh, cell culture studies uh, using TMS. Um, there, is, there are some studies on uh, using animals, but especially the in vitro cell culture studies are um, very few in the literature. So effect of TMS at cellular level is not very well understood. Uh, there is a need, uh, there's a critical need, I would say, to uh, study the effect of uh, transient fields on the neurons. Um, so we have attempted uh, to do that to some extent. Um, this can also um, tell us the benefits of TMS on various biological processes such as cell differentiation and neurogenesis. So what we did uh, when I was at Iowa State University was um, we, was, we uh, grew N27 cells. N27 cells are dopaminergic uh, cells that are derived from uh, rat brain. Um, so it's an immortalized line. Um, so we used uh, these N27 uh, cells uh, and applied uh, TMS fields on these cells um, and looked at various, um, various uh, parameters of cell growth, uh, cell differentiation, shape, and so on and so forth. Um, so why N27? Because we were interested in uh, looking at the dopamine um, effect or effect uh, or TMS effect on dopamine uh, in the brain. So the way we treated uh, N27 cells was we first grew the cells in uh, uh, T75 flasks. Um, so we seeded them with uh, uh, 10 to the power 6, that is a million cells. And then uh, they reach 100% confluency uh, in about 96 hours. So before they reach their confluency, we uh, uh, treated the cells. So the, we uh, put these T75 flasks on uh, the TMS coil. And we used figure of eight coil because we have figure of eight coils, uh, a figure of eight coil gives uh, two circular coils, each applying different directional field. So we can look at the effect of uh, direction of the field as well. So if you see uh, in the right-hand corner um, of the view graph, you can see that the direction of each coil is different, direction of field in each coil is different. So the dots indicate field uh, going into and the cross uh, indicates field coming out of the plane. So each, each of these T, uh, uh, T75 flasks experience uh, a different direction of magnetic field. So when we applied that field on, uh, on these cells um, during the time of their growth, uh, by the end, of their confluence, that is by 96 hours, uh, 72 hours, uh, we counted the number of cells. And uh, um, we found that the direction of the magnetic field affected their growth rate. So with field up, the, grow, uh, the neurons grow slightly um, 
uh, faster, that is the number of cells were higher with filled up and with filled down, the number of cells were slightly lower uh, compared to environmental conditions. So this uh, shows us that the um, uh, growth of these uh, N27 dopaminergic neuron cells can be controlled by uh, using different direction of magnetic field. That was uh, a very interesting uh, result. Um, so there are further studies. This was way back in 2014, and uh, um, the group continued to study this in terms of GDNF, BDNF growth factors, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, we are being funded by National Science Foundation to look at the other parameters such as the axonal length, um, the shape of the soma, uh, the number of dendrites um, with, uh, for different uh, uh, field strengths and field directionality. So we are now working uh, uh, with a collaborator at Iowa State University to fabricate microchannels on silicon um, to, to confine neurons um, so that we can control the uh, axonal growth. So that was about the in vitro cell studies. Now coming to the simulation at neuronal level. So um, we all know that an adult brain has about 80 billion neurons. So uh, they are connected in different uh, network pathways and uh, um, their connections are so complex. Each neuron is connected to about 10,000 other uh, neurons. Um, so there are 10,000 connections by uh, uh, these are the typical number of connections. So if you add them up, it, the number of connections you can have is quite large. So um, if you want to look at uh, any uh, neuronal pathway, you need to um, you need to look at individual neurons first and see. Um, how uh, the firing occurs and what are the external um, effects, especially a, a, a time varying magnetic field um, will, uh, will affect the firing rate and we need to um, investigate how this effect will result in, in a larger um, network. So, in order to do that, we uh, used a Python package called Nest, and uh, we used a standard neuron model uh, that is integrate and fire neuron fire neuron model. Um, so we um, built uh, we we specifically uh, targeted motor pathway. Um, so on your screen, you can see two motor pathways. Uh, they're very complex. Um, one is uh, uh, the uh, Parkinson's motor pathway, the other one is the healthy motor pathway. Um, so there are a uh, number of uh, nuclei, nuclei here, and uh, we, um, uh, we built each of these nuclei with certain amount, a certain number of neurons. In our case, we uh, uh, made 10,000 neurons for each of these nuclei and uh, made a uh, slightly simplified uh, motor pathway network for both Parkinson's as well as uh, healthy models. Um, so the difference between Parkinson's and healthy model is that uh, if you see as, uh, the SNC, that is substantia nigra uh, nuclei, um, the dopamine um, is cut off. So when there is dopamine uh, sh uh, shortage or dopamine, uh, when there is no dopamine um, here, so the uh, connection between the striatum and GPE uh, amplifies. 
So the inhibition uh, is amplified uh, from striatum to GPE and from STN to GPI, the excitation is amplified, uh, which affects the connection between thalamus and cortex. So um, we um, built these uh, models. Ours is slightly simplified in the sense we don't have a feedback from GPI to thalamus to, and from thalamus to cortex. So um, uh, in our case, right-hand side is the Parkinson's um, and the left-hand side is the um, healthy, uh, healthy uh, motor pathway. Um, so in the Parkinson, you can see we have removed the uh, uh, substantia nigra connections to D1 and D2 in striatum. So the red is the inhibit inhibitory pathway and the blue is the excitatory pathway. Um, so these each of these nuclei have about 10,000 neurons. And we uh, um, built these models um, uh, looking at the literature. So we designed our uh, uh, connection weightage um, based on the firing rate at different nuclei. So we matched our firing rate to the existing literature um, by modifying the connection weights. Um, yeah, so, um, so in healthy model, uh, you can see the firing of neurons so each of these dots on the left-hand side raster plot is the uh, firing from a neuron. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is number of firing. So this is uh, how uh, firing pattern, uh, in, uh, if you look at GPI, in a healthy, um, healthy brain. And all other uh, nuclei, um, uh, look uh, as shown, and uh, the the firing rates match that in the literature. So, um, if we remove the dopamine connection uh, from substantia nigra, we get this um, uh, synchronous firing at GPI, and that is in agreement with the literature. Um, so, this is these are the two models we built. Now that we wanted to see what happens if you apply uh, a clinical uh, DBS, um, so we use the clinical parameters um, of DBS uh, uh, stimulation uh, strengths and applied it on GPI. And, um, and if we look at the GPI, um, so this firing rate matches that of the uh, reported values in literature. So now we have a motor pathway uh, for Parkinson's with DBS that uh, uh, agrees with the published literature. So we wanted to see, can we use TMS and uh, uh, see what happens at different nuclei? Um, so we apply TMS uh, at 50 hertz on GPI, and we saw that um, the uh, GPI firing, um, the synchrony has reduced. Again, we have a, a figure of merit for calculating synchrony. Um, so the synchrony has reduced at GPI, um, and it's uh, slightly better than actually DBS um, synchrony uh, at GPI. So that means you can use TMS at 50 hertz on GPI to get um, uh, similar or better uh, effect um, than, the D, uh, than the DBS. However, you, it's, it's impossible to apply TMS at 50 hertz on GPI because GPI is way deep in the brain. So if you want to apply TMS at at uh, GPI with 50 hertz, um, uh, which is 120% of the motor threshold value, then you will have to significantly overstimulate the cortical regions. So that's why it's not possible right now with the existing technology. However, 
there are new ways where you can uh, uh, stimulate deeper regions of the brain without uh, excessively stimulating the cortex, which if we use those new, um, the, uh, uh, newer technologies, maybe it is possible. So this is the raster scan of all, uh, GPI. Um, uh, so it shows the firing patterns of healthy model, Parkinsonian model, and a DBS treated model and TMS treated model uh, at GPI. So, um, uh, coming on to now animal studies, I have about uh, 10 minutes left. I, I, I will just skip these animal studies because I, I want to show um, two other things that is simultaneous DBS and TMS treatment and brain phantom work. So this is a study that uh, that was brought to us by one of our collaborator, uh, Dr. Catherine Holloway. Um, so sh she has patients who need uh, or who developed uh, mouth, uh, speech impairment where after they have. Um, are um, even uh, after some times um, when they had DBS treatment. Um, so uh, she, wa she wanted to know if, uh, if she can use TMS treatment on mouth motor area uh, in order to um, mitigate the speech impairment in Parkinson's patients who already have DBS probe in their um, brain. So um, we uh, we wanted to investigate uh, this situation. That is uh, to see what is the electromagnetic inter interference between the DBS parameters or DBS uh, fields and the TMS fields. So we had to use our anatomically accurate brain models. Um, and insert a, um, a DBS uh, probe model and use a TMS model as well and look at what are the mutually affecting induced fields. So if you look at these figures, here you can see that uh, if you apply TMS in different orientations, you can cause different effects on DBS probe. Of course, you want to be as far away from DBS as possible, but if you want to uh, mitigate mouth, uh, speech uh, impairment, um, then you have to target mouth motor area, which is around here. Um, so uh, we, uh, we looked at mouth motor area TMS stimulation with DBS probe in the brain, and we look, uh, and our results show that when you stimulate mouth motor area, um, the induced electric field um, on mouth motor area is su sufficient to, uh, uh, or is above threshold to initiate action potential. But um, at the DBS area, um, the induced electric field is way lower. Uh, that's represented by this orange and uh, uh, pink dots here, whereas the blue one is the mouth motor area, which is which is what we want. We want high induced electric field on mouth motor area by TMS, and we want low um, fields at the um, at the DBS area or basal ganglia um, area. So that's what we saw. Um, so we can uh, say that this. Uh, if you uh, use TMS on mouth motor area, it is uh, uh, it is safe. However, um, if you have uh, coils or, uh, coils of um, DBS that are wound uh, uh, very close to TMS coil, then um, the induced electric fields 
in DBS area and basal ganglia can increase. So you need to know how are these uh, DB, the extra DBS uh, probe coils wound beneath the, or on the skull um, after the surgery. So based on that, you might have different induced electric fields in basal ganglia and or in uh, uh, STN where the stimulation occurs. So we also look, looked at temperature effects and we saw that there is very little temperature change um, due to TMS um, on a brain that has DBS probe. So that is uh, TMS DBS. Now coming on to um, development of uh, anatomically accurate brain phantoms, physical brain phantoms that can be used for uh, feasibility studies such as DBS and TM simultaneous DBS and TMS stimulation uh, or any other neuromodulation. And they can also be used for neuroimaging. So if you look in the literature for brain phantoms, uh, the most popular are these two that are used for neuroimaging. That, that these are developed by a National Institute of Standards and Technology for calibrating uh, MRI uh, machines. And so uh, there is lack of uh, brain phantom, especially for uh, neuromodulation. So since we have um, lots of anatomically accurate computational brain models. Um, we have a big database of several uh, disorders uh, as well as healthy patients. So we thought, well, we can uh, make a physical brain phantom. How do we do that? So we basically take the computational head model and convert it into an STL uh, file that can be understood by a 3D printer. So when we do that, uh, of course, you can print, uh, uh, 3D print uh, a brain in, in the form of the plastic that comes, or a polymer uh, that comes with the 3D printer. But that's not what we want. We want to have an uh, anatomically accurate brain phantom that can show us the stimulation strengths. So in order to do that, we had to uh, come up with a new technique that is called, we call it as, uh, shelling and rapid prototyping uh, with, uh, with uh, new composite material. So we uh, basically developed shells of these uh, different layers uh, in which you can fill uh, a polymer. So if in this view graph, you, these are uh, on the left-hand side at the bottom, are the shelled uh, gray matters, gray matter areas. Um, and on the right, here is a full gray matter, white matter combined uh, brain with a polymer. So basically we create different uh, shells of uh, gray white matter um, and then pour this uh, polymer into these uh, you know, plastic uh, uh, shells. And then we dissolve these plastic shells uh, that doesn't affect the polymer. But these polymers are not conductive. So we had to make our own conductive polymer. So we did that. So we basically used uh, carbon nanotubes and PDMS to, to create uh, gray matter and white matter uh, that has uh, similar conductivity uh, to that of reported uh, in the literature. So we made a, um, uh, we made gray matter uh, with the conductivity of 0.3 Siemens per, minute, uh, per meter, and then we made white matter of conductivity of 0.35 or 0.4 Siemens per meter. So um, we uh, 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 we prepared this polymer that is conduct the, the whose conductivity is similar to gray matter and white matter. So we, we, you can see in this graph, these are the uh, scanning electron, uh, electron microscopic images uh, with different uh, carbon nanotube compositions. So in the graph, you can see that as you increase the carbon nanotube composition, the conductivity 
um, increases. So we had to use a composition that had uh, similar conductivity as gray matter and white matter. So we also made sure that the phantom that was developed is anatomically accurate. Um, so we verified that using a CT scan of our prepared brain phantom. So the physical phantom that has been prepared is shown on the left-hand side. And then we measured the stimulation strengths using a TMS. So here on the right-hand side, you can see that um, the, the top one in the black is the uh, is the, is a single pulse. So uh, we that's the pulse. The blue one, blue uh, blue curve is the pulse that is measured inside the phantom, and the white curve is the reference voltage. So um, we measured the induced uh, voltages in different regions of the phantom. And when you go deeper, you can see that the voltage uh, drops rapidly uh, on the right-hand side. And here, uh, for different voltages, you get uh, different, um, uh, sorry, different, for different currents in the coil, you get different voltages uh, in the probe. So that's the uh, phantom work. So we have a anatomically, uh, accurate brain phantom with which you can measure the stimulation strengths um, and that matches the conductivity of gray matter and white matter and uh, and that has uh, uh, similar features as um, as a human brain so uh, this concludes my talk so in conclusion um, I'd like to say that TMS is a non-invasive, safe, and surgery-free neuromodulation technique that can be used to treat several neurological and psychiatric disorders. More in vitro and animal studies are needed to understand the mechanism underlying TMS treatment. And uh, neuronal circuit modeling, uh, modeling uh, suggests that TMS at 50 hertz on GPI may help elevate pathological bursting in Parkinson's disease head models. And we have developed an uh, anatomically realistic uh, brain phantom um, that can be used for uh, testing um, ne different neuromodulation techniques and also can be used for calibrating MRI equipment. I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, group members and uh, my funding agencies. Here is here are the contact details. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to respond to you. I, you can either contact me by email, phone, or on Twitter. That's all I have. Thank you very much um, for patience hearing. Thank you.